I've got three o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm Tom Strout, the president of the Satellite Industry Association, and I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar with AAS on the impact of satellite constellations on optical astronomy. Just a little bit of background on, the, uh, on this event. About three months ago, Joel Perriott and I discussed how we might engage the broader satellite community in discussions that had been taking place with SpaceX. And this is one of the means that we came up to be able to do so. We're hoping to accomplish three things today. The first is to discuss the challenges posed to observe, uh, uh, observatories by satellite constellations, and also how to best engage with all of the parties to find solutions. And finally, to discuss the role of observatories in the private sectors in mitigating impacts. We have four, four speakers today, so we've got a very full program. Uh, we're hoping to cover as many questions as possible at the end, and I'd ask you to use the Q&A button to ask your questions. I'm going to introduce each of our speakers as they're getting ready to speak, and I'm going to start with Megan Donahue, who's the Professor of Physics and Astrophysics at Michigan State University and the AAS President. She's going to provide an introduction and a summary of the main impact. Megan, over to you. need to unmute. I want to lead off with a video showing uh, the launch of 60 SpaceX Constellation satellites uh, as they were uh, launched about a year ago. Um, this is before they uh, achieved their uh, final altitude, but while they are uh, getting there, um, they are quite bright and visible to the naked eye. I had problems with the rehearsal right here too. Okay, they also affect science images. So here's a picture from the uh, Saratololo uh, dark energy camera, which is a very wide field, two square degrees on the sky, taken in November of 2019. This is a single 300 uh, plus second exposure, and you see 19 satellites crossing the field of view during the course of that exposure. Each uh, crossing takes about four seconds and the pixels underneath those uh, tracks are basically lost to the science. So why are these uh, satellites so bright? Well, um, they basically reflect or scatter sunlight and even satellites that are really close to the earth are visible uh, in nearly full or full sunlight as seen from the nighttime side of the earth, especially near the times of uh, uh, sunset or uh, sunrise. So these near earth satellites are uh, visible in the beginnings and ends of night. And the higher they are, the longer they're visible during the night, but they're somewhat fainter. So how do you lessen the light interference? Well, there's, there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, reducing reflectivity or quote unquote painted black. Unfortunately, you're gonna hear that that isn't the um, only solution. And in fact, um, it has a counter solution problem that it makes the satellites heat up. Uh, reflecting or scattering sunlight elsewhere. Um, of course, controlling the reflection direction. Uh, another way to reduce the light interference is to make uh, and launch fewer satellites um, that would make it easier to dodge them in between exposures, um, making them smaller or more efficient uh, and therefore reflecting less light. And also it's key to make them fairly predictable so that if their orbits are very, very uh, predictable like clockwork, um, it may be possible to schedule exposures to avoid them that way. So, these satellite trails are going to uh, affect astronomy as a science and astronomy as a science uh, is, is uh, uh, integral with uh, the understanding of fundamental physics. Um, our understanding of what most of the matter in the universe is made out of dark matter um, 
what most of the energy in the universe is, dark energy, um, and basic fundamental particle physics comes from the study of astrophysics. Uh, cosmology tells us the history and age of the universe. Uh, in the last 20 years, we've become aware of planets outside our own solar system, and so it's become tenable to talk about life on other worlds uh, through exoplanet discoveries. Uh, we're not done with our own solar system either. There's lots to learn about our own solar system, and in particular, uh, the possibility of impact threat uh, from objects in our own solar system to detect and follow these, these possible sources of, of, of impacts um, are made possible um, by surveying the night sky. My own field of astronomy, I work on a very uh, difficult technique known as weak gravitational lensing that allows us to do to measure dark matter, measure dark energy, and indeed the neutrino mass. This uh, technique is difficult enough that it actually drives the specs for many of our observatories. Um, and even faint stars, like the one I've circled here, can make the analysis of this field and uh, for uh, images taken by the same detector afterwards, very challenging. And a bright satellite is the equivalent of a much brighter star streaking across the field, affecting a broad swath of pixels and leaving residues in later images. So it can make the uh, analyses of these uh, images uh, difficult, challenging, and in some cases impossible. It's also important to understand that our facilities in astronomy work as a system. So one facility be, being affected uh, in a, um, for example, a wide field telescope, it affects the science that's possible by other telescopes. So for example, transient sources are detected by one telescope, like LIGO and gravitational waves, and followed up by others uh, to identify and study the source of those gravitational waves. Rare but important objects are also discovered in these wide field searches and followed up by observations with large telescopes with small fields of view, with spectrographs or space telescopes that can detect X-ray and UV photons. So the astronomical system is a system of telescopes. It's not just you know, one telescope being affected and the others are not affected. If one telescope is affected, we're all affected. So wide field telescopes like the Vera Rubin Observatory and PANSTARS are crucial elements of our international astronomical network to take the best advantages of investments in $8 billion telescopes like James Webb Space Telescope. So let's just expand on that a little bit. The international multi-messenger astronomy effort uh, are all these observatories particle detectors, light detectors, gravitational wave detectors, working together to uncover how the universe works. And for a transient, a fast fading source, we might not have the luxury to wait and observe it tomorrow or next year. So in closing, the night sky as seen from the planet Earth is international. It belongs to all of us, not one institution, not one country. It's crucial to our fundamental scientific understanding of the universe and the, uh, the rules that guide it. It's our best view of beyond the planet and it's our cheap seats. So some astronomy can only be done from space. So X-ray and UV astronomy, those photons can't penetrate our atmosphere. We need those telescopes to be in space. They're expensive. It's very expensive to put a telescope in space. I don't think I have to uh, emphasize that to this audience. And so to make progress, our very biggest telescopes with the biggest data rates have to be located on Earth to take full advantage of what we can achieve both on Earth and in space. Thank you. Great, thank you, Megan. Um, before we move on, I also I want to mention again that uh, we'll be taking questions. There's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, uh, so please go ahead and ask your questions. And our plan is to ask the questions at the conclusion of each of our uh, of all of our speakers. 
Um, also, I want to let everybody know that we will make the slides available. I realize there are some people that may have had uh, problems joining on time. And we've also been asked about whether we're going to make a recording available. We need to go through some uh, internal approvals with our speakers organizations, but our hope is to be able to do that. So we'll get that information available to you when, it's, when we have it available. Let me move on to, uh, to our next speaker, uh, which is Pat Seitzer, who is a professor in the Department of Astronomy at the University of Michigan. He's also representing the AAS Committee on Light Pollution, Radio Interference, and Space Debris. Over to you, Pat. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, my background on this is I did, or I continue to do observations of orbital optical observations of space debris at uh, geosynchronous orbit. Uh, that was funded by NASA for many years, and I served on the NASA delegation to the IADC from 2001 to 2015. So Megan did a great introduction. One of the things I want to point out is that modern astronomy uses a wide variety of telescopes, whoops, of telescopes and fields of view. And so this is a picture of an, um, taken from an all sky camera in my driveway, uh, not from a real observatory. The field of view is about 170 degrees. The aperture is a few millimeters and it sees many bright stars. It doesn't go particularly faint. In this case, we're seeing um, many bright satellites. In this case, we see two satellites, the International Space Station up here in the top part, which we can't do anything about, and uh, the uh, a tumbling rocket body down here. So that's just one of the examples. It's probably the worst, uh, you know, the, the smallest, brightest objects it will see. But then we moved to a very large telescope, the four meter telescope, Blanco telescope in Chile. This is the diameter, four times the diameter of the full moon. Megan showed it. This is looking at a small section of the sky, um, but has the potential of many satellites being visible at once. So when this image was taken and similar images like it were taken last year, you know, we realized this was uh, when the Starlinks were in their initial orbit configuration and they were uh, close to Earth. But the fear was if you launch 20 or 30 or 40,000 additional satellites, many, if not most, astronomical images would look like this. And that's not something we were very interested in. So how do bright satellites affect observations on telescopes? Well, here's an image taken with DECAM, which shows going down uh, from upper left to lower right is a very bright satellite which saturated the detector. This one also has a faint satellite crossing it. And the bright satellite streaks, the streak itself saturates the detector. And what that means is as you look here, you can see that it's flat topped. Normally that would be a very sharp peak. You can think of a, the element of a uh, detector as being like a pail and it can only take hold so much water before it overfills and affects the neighboring, um, neighboring pails. This results of loss of information in the pixels, the crosstalk in the electronics, ghost images, and possible residual images in the next um, images that follow. These last three comments here, crosstalk, ghost images, and residual images, depend very much on the camera and the telescope. So they may be very strong effects on one telescope camera combination and less strong on others. So, um, let me show you what we can do this. So another thing about uh, satellite trails is that the exposure time for the satellite is not the image exposure time. So the previous exposure was 333 seconds. It's the exposure time for the satellite is the time it takes the satellite to cross a pixel. And this is on the order of milliseconds. And these large bright satellites are so bright and the telescopes are so large and fast that uh, even if an exposure time of a couple of milliseconds will cause the satellite to saturate the detector. Something else we're gonna try to emphasize here is that higher altitude satellites travel slower, thanks to Isaac Newton, and thus they have a longer effective exposure time. So we also lose information in the non-saturated streaks but uh, for the moment, they're not uh, a significant problem. So here's an example of ghost images. This is again taken from DECAM. You can see a bright star down here in the lower right. And they, these are all ghost images. These are reflections. 
in the telescope optics. And now the telescope optics are probably transmissive to better than 99%, but it is, it is impossible to build systems that are um, transmit 100% of the light. For the radio frequency engineers on, that are listening, their, the analogy here would be, um, uh, you know, you, you have uh, uh, off-axis uh, response on radio telescopes and you generate multiple frequencies uh, when you generate a, a telescope or when you generate an RF signal. So when are satellites visible? The observer has to be in darkness. This depends on latitude and the time of year. And the satellite has to be in sunlight or penumbra, not in earth shadow. That depends on the orbital inclination, the altitude, and the time of year. So you might say, okay, but wait a minute, Professor, there's a lot of stuff in Earth orbit today. So why, why are you so concerned about a few new things? Well, the space age began and astronomers' problems started back in 1957 with the launch of Sputnik 1. And you can see that down here at the lower right. Oops. Um, at the lower left. And this is a plot from the NASA Orbital Debris Program Office, which shows the number of objects in orbit as a function of type. Astronomers are interested in the top curve, which is everything in orbit. Anything in Earth orbit that reflects sunlight is of concern. Now, these are objects larger than 10 centimeters. Most of these will not be seen in telescopes, not even Vera Rubin. But the catalog is very incomplete, and it is um, probably by about a factor of two. So let's take a look at how many of these objects would be visible from Chile, home of the Vera Rubin, um, at the, in springtime. So I crank all 18,207 Earth orbiting objects in the public catalog um, for the 22nd and 23rd of September. And uh, I discovered that at any one time, even at midnight, okay, even at midnight, between these two red lines, there's between six and 700 objects in sunlight above me in my telescope in darkness at an elevation greater than 30 degrees. The red lines are the sun is minus 18 degrees elevation. That's what astronomers consider astronomical twilight. And that's, we'd rather not have you have anything visible on these red lines. So, so if we have six to 700 objects visible, why do we care if you launch all sorts of new large constellations? The answer is brightness. The new satellites are going to be brighter than 99% of all objects in orbit now. This is the first takeaway I want you to remember. Your new satellites in these constellations are going to be brighter than 99% of all the objects in orbit now. And SpaceX is going to multiply the population by about a factor of 10. The other thing I want you to take away is that we astronomers are interested in the brightness of a satellite in the entire life cycle of the satellite. And there are three phases of a constellation's lifetime. The initial mission phase, and that's what you're observing now, and that's what uh, everyone is so concerned about. The satellites are at low altitude and a non-standard attitude or orientation. There's the operational phase, which can last five years or more. And finally, there's a deorbit phase. Presumably now they're in a high drag configuration where the orbit is lowered until the satellite burns up in the atmosphere. We want you to consider the brightness of your satellites in all three phases through the complete life cycle uh, of a satellite. So I've done some modeling. Uh, how visible will these satellite constellations be to astronomers? And I did the initial Starlink constellation as approved by the FCC. It's been superseded by a larger, by a different configuration now, but we're going to use this one as a reference constellation to understand what if questions. Uh, the definite, and there are some published papers by McDowell and Heinet and Williams, uh, which can go into considerably more detail for more constellations. The definitions of twilight, when the sun is below 18 degrees, it's useful for calibration. When it's 18 degrees or more below the horizon, it's the darkest time and when you would observe the faintest objects. The sun at minus 18 degrees is the red line in the plots. And I'm going to show you satellites only when they're more than 30 degrees above the horizon as seen by the observer. Uh, 20 degrees is a lower limit, um, but um, that's used mainly by the near-Earth orbit, the killer asteroid people. So let's look at the winter in Chile, the longest night of the year. Um, this is in June, and you can see that the, uh, the steady state is there's between six and nine starlings visible at any one time. 
And most of the starlings are gone within an hour after the start of astronomical twilight. So this is not a large number of satellites visible. But suppose you multiply this by 10 or 20 or 30 or 40, and all of a sudden you start to have large numbers. If we go to spring in Chile, now midnight is the center of the plot. Again, about within one hour of uh, astronomical twilight, most of the starlings are gone at 550 kilometers. If I look in Chile in December, which is the shortest night of the year, I see that now I'm approaching about an hour and a half after twilight, astronomical twilight. Um, the starlings, there are still starlings at 550 available or visible. Multiply these numbers by 10 or 20 or 30 or 40. But even here, we have three hours of uh, twilight, three hours of night when there are no starlings at 550 available. Well, I told you there were a whole bunch of parameters that depended on the brightness of the satellite. What if SpaceX had launched those satellites into an original planned orbit of 1150 kilometers? Well, it turns out they're fainter, but not visible to the eye, but still saturate the detector. There are more satellites visible, and they're longer past twilight and into the darkest part of the night. So this shows you in springtime in Chile, whoops, all of a sudden, there are about four to five times the number of starlings visible at any one time, and they're visible now two hours past astronomical twilight, first in the evening and then in the morning. Multiply this by whatever factor you want. Let's go to that short summer night. Boom. Now, at 1,584 starlings, they're visible all night long. And multiply this by 10 or 20, and it's a serious problem for astronomers. So the high-altitude satellites cause us considerably more grief because they're visible longer into the darkest part of the night. They're past our astronomical red lines. The streak brightness, because we're not measuring these things as point sources, it also depends on the angular velocity v. And thanks to Isaac Newton, we know objects in higher orbits have smaller angular velocity and thus a greater time on each pixel. Um, so um, they are there. They're brighter than you would initially expect if you were just scaling them by one over r squared. The objects at 1,200 kilometers will be in focus. There'll be a sharp peak. Not so for the objects at 350 kilometers. They'll be out of focus for large, fast telescopes. The streaks will be broader and more pixels lost. Think of the depth of field, few, depth of field on a camera. These telescopes focused at infinity, but they're so fast that meteors at 60 kilometers and objects in low Earth orbit, 350 to 500 kilometers, will be out of focus. Finally, let's talk about the brightness of satellites. This is a really complicated problem. Uh, it depends on a large number of factors, and I'm just going to mention some of them. The altitude, the orientation of the spacecraft, the albedo, the size, the surface characteristics, whether it's specular versus diffuse reflection, self-shadowing, solar phase angle. Don't, satellites are not Lambertian spheres. They're not like the moon, and don't even try to model them like that, because you'll get a very misleading answer. The future in LEO, the big three, the 1584 starlinks are just the start, and this shows you some of the other constellations that have filed. The Amazon satellites, could they be visible to the unaided eye? Depends on design and surface treatment. The OneWeb satellites at station now, the six that are at 1,200 kilometers, they are not visible to the eye. They're about eighth magnitude. They still saturate the Vera Rubin detectors. And since we don't know what the future of the OneWeb project will be, uh, we'll have to leave that one. But those satellites are still a significant threat, to, a challenge to big, fast telescopes like Vera Rubin. So these are my conclusions. The new satellites are brighter than 99% of the current objects in orbit. Only a small fraction of the total constellation is visible. That could be a very large number if thousands and thousands launch. Constellations at higher altitudes are a, are a significant challenge to, astronomer, to astronomers, and Tony's going to emphasize that again. We ask you to consider the full lifetime of the constellation for impact on astronomy, all three phases. And the brightness of the satellite is a complicated problem. Many factors analyzed in your design phase. So thank you very much, and I'll return it to, to Mission Control. Great. Thank you, Pat. 
Our next speaker is Tony Tyson, who's a professor in the Department of Physics at UC Davis and the chief scientist for the Vera Rubin Observatory. Tony, over to you. Okay, hi everybody. Still attempting to share, there we go. So I'm gonna talk to you about the effects of satellites on low Earth orbiting, uh, low Earth orbiting satellites on the Vera Rubin Observatory. Um, and uh, my first slide, which eventually will come up here, I think. Uh, maybe. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, this next slide shows the telescope, which is in the middle. It's an eight and a half meter mirror. And on, the, on its left, uh, not to scale, is the 3200 megapixel camera. This observatory, as it turns out, is the most impacted by satellites uh, because it's something really, really new. That's why it was ranked tops in the last um, uh, uh, decadal survey in astronomy and astrophysics for ground-based facilities uh, because it makes a color motion picture of the entire universe over a period of 10 years. This is, and, and it has an extremely wide field of view. This, as it turns out, is the perfect machine for A, discovering the unexpected, uh, which is its mission, but B, running into uh, satellite trails. And so the Rubin Observatory is going to execute uh, what we call the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, uh, abbreviated LSST. Uh, it'll produce the deepest, widest view of our dynamic universe. Uh, you can read the numbers there. It's a large mirror. It's a huge camera. Uh, each image will be the size of 40 full moons. And it scans the sky, the entire visible sky, uh, uh, with about 200 uh, 2,000 images per night. And uh, it'll embark very soon on a 10-year survey of the sky. It'll find over 37 billion stars and galaxies. But more importantly than even that, uh, it will find things that we have no idea. Uh, it'll find uh, things that explode or move on the sky. There will be, we think, about 10 million of these alerts every single night. And uh, within 60 seconds of discovery, this alert will be issued worldwide. So you might imagine that this very rapid, uh, repeated scan of the sky to extremely faint uh, depths uh, would be impacted by bright, bright satellite trails, and you would be right. The observatory, for just for calibration purposes, it can see in a just a 10 second exposure, it can see a golf ball at the distance of the moon. Uh, millions, 20 million times fainter than uh, you can see with your eye. So it's a very sensitive thing and it looks at a very broad piece of the sky. That's where the physics and astronomy comes from. Here's a picture that was taken back a couple of years ago. Uh, we were almost ready to put the cladding on the dome. Uh, it's a very good site in northern Chile. We're almost finished with construction. <clears throat> this was taken earlier this year. Uh, you can see our construction ending up on the dome and the survey will start uh, in 2022 and go for 10 years. So um, what about the satellites? This is uh, one of the first satellites that were launched by uh, SpaceX. This is their uh, so-called version 0 0.9 satellite that you've probably heard of. Um, and you see those four uh, uh, phased arrays on the bottom. Later, I'm gonna be talking about something called DarkSat. Uh, where uh, what they did is they made these black to see uh, what effect they had. But these satellites, there were 60 of them uh, uh, early, uh, about a year ago, right after launch. And at that time, uh, John Tonnery, who's on the right here, he has a really, a really cute uh, survey that he's doing for uh, alerting us to the very last plunging orbit of an Earth-threatening asteroid. And uh, you don't as it turns out, need a very large telescope to do that. Uh, there's this telescope. 
but it has a field of view about the same as the LSST cam, our, 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 our camera. And on the left, you can see just by chance, two uh, Starlink satellites intersecting there. And that was with 60. And now you can multiply, uh, as Pat said, with whatever number you can imagine all of these satellites launched by, by everybody in every nation, roughly a thousand times this, if, if you want to get an idea of how impossible the sky becomes for a very wide field, uh, a very fast, deep survey of the sky. So we did some initial tests. Uh, we ran our simulator to find out uh, what fraction of our 30 second visits, we, we visit every patch of the sky for 30 seconds and then uh, move on to another nearby patch and repeat this um, all night long uh, for uh, 10 years. And so this is the fraction of fields uh, with the satellite in a 30 second exposure. And you can see that um, for a large number of satellites like what uh, we imagine people are going to have uh, mid next decade, uh, for roughly 48,000 satellites uh, in twilight, and by the way, a whole lot of twilight observing, uh, as Pat mentioned, is going to be dedicated to planetary programs such as finding Earth-threatening asteroids. You can see that virtually 90% of our fields uh, are impacted with uh, at least one trail. Uh, if you have a smaller number of satellites, only 12,000, you still get upwards towards 45% uh, of the fields uh, having a, a uh, having a satellite trail in them, bright satellite trail. And then um, instead of twilight, if you go to the middle of the night at midnight, uh, even uh, as Pat said, even, um, uh, even in this Chilean summer, uh, you can see that about 20% of the fields will have a, a satellite. So it becomes a problem under normal um, uh, cadence, so-called operations for our telescope. So then you can ask, okay, how about dodging them? Suppose you get infinitely accurate orbital elements. What can you do? And so we did that simulation here. You can see uh, in, this, uh, in this plot, uh, so this is funny units. Uh, so vertic uh, the vertical axis is a number of observations that we take in just the first three days of a 10-year survey. And on the, on the x-axis down here, this is on the right, this is the beginning of, uh, this is the end of civil twilight. Uh, so you can't read a newspaper uh, at this point uh, at night. Um, this is the beginning of uh, what we call twilight, and a lot of uh, planetary programs uh, take place here. So this blue, this blue um, uh, curve here is if there are no satellites whatsoever, no LEO sets. And this is the natural distribution of the number of observations we would obtain as a function of how far down below the horizon the sun goes. So it's minus 20, minus 30, minus 40. And if you're at minus 30 degrees latitude, like Cerro Tololo and uh, Cerro Patron, where we are, uh, then uh, there's a huge number, of course, that pile up at minus 55, as it turns out. So uh, what happens if you get 12,000 satellites? Uh, the news is not good. As you can see, you're losing a fairly big fraction of all of your observations. Um, basically, um, it's a wild goose chase. You go to a field and you get ready to open the shutter and oops, there's a satellite. And then if they're uh, roughly 48,000, it's uh, truly hopeless. So we think that uh, there's some improvements on this algorithm to be made, but it's really going to be a losing battle in the end. So all, as Megan said, all optical astronomy observatories will be affected to some degree by the light pollution generated by LEOSATs. Uh, the actual issue is the number of satellites there are, the frequency of these trails in the data, and their brightness. Uh, the Ribbon Observatory is the limiting case uh, simply because uh, of the unprecedented throughput, which is the product of the light collection of the huge mirror and the wide field of view per exposure. And so it's most impacted by this. And uh, as Megan pointed out, it, there's a spin-off effect uh, uh, damaging science at all of their observatories that feed on our survey results. So on the left here is shown a cutaway diagram of our 3200 megapixel camera. And you can see the uh, 189 charge couple devices here in the focal plane. 
And on the right is a, uh, a cartoon of the focal plane showing uh, all of these uh, CCDs and a moon for scale. This shows the same kind of thing, but now with a satellite trail uh, going through it, and you can see that a typical, if you draw a bunch of lines across this, the typical trail will probably affect uh, something like 12 to 16 of these CCDs. Uh, and uh, the rest of the, the data would be useful, but it would affect all of the CCDs along this trail. So we went into the laboratory and uh, exposed one of the LSST CAM CCDs to a trail that is as bright as the Starlink uh, version uh, 0 0.9. That's this bright trail in the middle. That's, that's, a, uh, that's a simulated Starlink in the lab onto, onto one of our CCDs. And guess what? Uh, you can see all of these other ghost uh, trails that are created by the electronics and the CCD itself. No system is perfect, no system is linear, and it's the nonlinearities of this that really worry us. Uh, this does not appear to scale with intensity. Uh, these so-called crosstalk trails are nonlinear. So it's a very tough uh, analysis program. But if we, we discovered in the lab that if the, these LeoSats could be darkened to about seventh magnitude, assuming that they're at 550, if they could be darkened to about seventh magnitude from their existing fifth magnitude or 4.5, uh, then special pixel uh, processing can remove the ghost, these ghost trails, which is good news, uh, but it means that the satellites would have to be darkened uh, considerably over what uh, the version, the orig original version was. Uh, so uh, there was a test that uh, SpaceX uh, did. Uh, here's some follow-up observations from the ground. Um, actually from the same Blanco telescope. Uh, five recent Starlinks that were launched, you can see them. Four of them are up there at an apparent magnitude of 5.2, roughly 5.1. And there down below here is DarkSat, where the, those four panels, uh, the phased array panels have been darkened. And you can see it made, a, it made a significant difference. It was down by a factor of roughly three, if you account for all of the improvements that are already made in these from the original uh, version 0 0.9. So, so progress is being made. Uh, we still have to get to seventh magnitude somehow. That's another magnitude. So SpaceX is working with the astronomy community to reduce the light pollution effects on optical astronomy. And making the Starlink satellite seventh magnitude, uh, if they're at 550, uh, can remove some of these crosstalk uh, trails, uh, crosstalk and ghosting and electronic effects. Um, and we're working with SpaceX to measure the effect of darkening the test satellites. Um, and they have future plans, uh, which you'll hear about from Patricia Cooper uh, momentarily. Uh, however, uh, even if all this happens, and uh, I think we're on the track to make it happen, the trail, the original satellite trail is still in the data. It's still there. There's no way, way we can remove that. It's huge. It's very bright. It's very high signal to noise ratio. and uh, it, and, and it complicates data analysis and actually limits discovery potential uh, because, well, it's an unexpected thing and that's what we're looking for. So uh, the analysis of the Blanco telescope imaging, which I showed you just now, of five recent Starlinks, demonstrates some progress to the darkening goal that, uh, we need to see. DarkSat came in uh, happily at uh, 6.1 magnitude. Visorsat, which you'll hear about in a minute, uh, may reach the goal of seventh magnitude for LeoSats at 550. And uh, the SpaceX brightness mitigation efforts, this is the bottom line, I believe, for all of us. The, the, these efforts that SpaceX has undertaken set an example for um, others to follow. So looking forward then to the next decade, industry together with the astronomy community must address all of these issues. We must work together uh, jointly to develop operation solutions. For example, tools for efficient scheduling. Uh, LeoSats at 1200, as you have heard, are completely incompatible with optical astronomy. Uh, it would blow us out of the water, unfortunately. And uh, we need to operate maybe if we can't if we can't solve all these problems, and I, I suspect we won't solve all of them, we need, uh, we need to ask ourselves whether 
we would have to compensate by operating longer. We could do that. We could go for 12 years instead of 10, but there's a huge science opportunity cost when you do something like that. So that's the end of my presentation. Thanks. Great, thank you, Tony. And as Tony mentioned, our next speaker is Patricia Cooper, who's the Vice President, Satellite Government Affairs for SpaceX. And I should also note my uh, predecessor is the president of the Satellite Industry Association. Patricia is going to talk about uh, some of the things that SpaceX is doing to address the issues that have been raised. Patricia? Thank you, Tom. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's good to join this bridge between the satellite community that I've been a part of for so long and the astronomers that I've really come to respect and whose collaboration I've been grateful for this year. So um, most of you, certainly by now, in the, in the course of our hour, are familiar with uh, SpaceX's Starlink project. We haven't talked a lot about what it actually is meant to do. It's a constellation of many low-flying satellites with the express purpose of providing broadband connectivity globally. I think right now, uh, it's really never been more obvious how important access to reliable, high-quality internet is um, for us to work, for us to learn, for us to support our communities, take care of each other, and just billions in the world do not have access today. That was the prompt for us to build this project uh, and start it on May 23rd, 2019, just almost exactly a year ago today, with our first launch of 60 Starlink satellites. Uh, as of today, we've got uh, 420 satellites uh, in orbit. Uh, we were uh, our first... Go ahead, the next slide, Joan. Um, our next, uh, our constellation is meant to be about 4,409 satellites, uh, all operating at relatively low altitudes. Um, we continue to launch satellites because we want to get the threshold of numbers of satellites in view uh, that will allow us to provide continuous broadband. Uh, we expect to start offering service in the second half of this year for the US and Canada, and then continue to grow beyond that. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, as we, as we uh, undertook that launch just almost exactly a year ago today, many were very excited, but it also was the trigger for the concern that you heard today from astronomy. And uh, I would just say, you know, particularly today on the eve of returning human spaceflight from the U.S., SpaceX has from the very beginning of this, uh, of, of this period been uh, deeply moved by the sort of spirit of discovery and the quest for knowledge of the skies and deeper space that astronomy has always embodied. So for the past year, we've spent um, working closely with the astronomers on this call, many others, um, with AAS, other professional groups around the world, a technical collaboration with the Rubin Observatory so that we can better understand uh, the specifics of their observations and their telescopes and give us a better sort of information platform to be able to look at mitigations that we might engineer to reduce the brightness of our satellites. You can go to the next slide. We were surprised by how bright our satellites were. I will, I will tell you that right now. Um, we've been pretty clear about that, but we've set today two goals. Um, we have, we've, we're working against these two objectives. Um, first, to make the satellites generally invisible to the unaided eye within a week of each launch. Uh, and then also to minimize the effect that we have on astronomy, which is the part that you've been hearing about, by darkening the satellites that they don't saturate observatory detectors. I'll tell you that we started out really with that second goal as our primary goal, our primary focus. It's when the satellites are on orbit longest um, and then have expanded to the next goals, which are this naked eye visibility during the, um, the uh, orbit rays phase of life, the post-launch pre-operational phase. Um, and so this sort of shows where, what we're aiming to do uh, with the mitigations that we'll talk a little bit about now. Next slide. I, I wanted to show you the satellites themselves and just show how uh, they are different and how they are uh, perceived from the ground in terms of visibility and also how it changes what the mitigations are. Um, for the phase on the left, which is when the satellites are on station, when they are uh, 
at about 550 kilometers for these satellites and uh, in their operational phase of providing broadband connectivity. The satellites have the a flat bottom of the spacecraft facing the Earth. These satellites are sort of long and flat and designed to be able to launch many in a rocket and deploy as much broadband connectivity per launch as possible. Uh, and while still providing high quality broadband and uh, maintaining space safety being fully demisable. So in the operational phase, they're oriented uh, in a different method with a different mode compared to the Earth's surface and the, and the uh, solar array is in a different configuration. For the shorter few weeks when the satellites are during orbit rays, uh, the brightness is primarily not driven by the Earth facing uh, part of the satellite that contains the broadband antennas, but it also is affected by the solar array, which is in a different orientation with respect to the satellites uh, to, uh, to lower the drag of the spacecraft while they're after deployment, after they've had their health checks, and they're starting to orbit rays, uh, either directly to orbit or go to a parking orbit until they can jump into their, uh, their designed uh, orbit. So the the cause, the source of brightness is different for each of these two configurations, and that has driven our approach for uh, mitigations. Next slide. So on orbit, our focus has primarily been on darkening the satellite. Got a lot of feedback that just said spray paint them black. It turns out, as, as Pat mentioned, that is not, uh, uh, that's not enough, but it's also not the most uh, complete solution. We did in January launch uh, DarkSat, which which Tony mentioned, which was a, spa uh, a spacecraft that had had many of the elements uh, darkened. Uh, those elements were the those that we had been able to observe as the, the primary sources of of brightness and see what that would do in terms of um, improvements in their visibility and impact on astronomy. Uh, so that was launched in January, and then we worked with telescopes around the world to observe it comparatively with the uh, other unmitigated satellites. And that 3% reduction in brightness is promising, but the darkening as a technique, as Megan mentioned, has some limitations because it makes the satellite hot. It uh, affects the thermal properties of the satellite in a way that not only uh, limits the broadband capability, the sort of functionality of the space cap, but it also means that the satellite gets hot and it becomes a problem for other kinds of astronomy that are looking at infrared and the, uh, trying to detect uh, other elements in the sky. So we have expanded our um, experimentation to, uh, to simply block the sun's reach from the satellite with sun shades. So in the next launch, which is launch seven for us, um, we will launch a single experiment of visor sat, um, which is uh, a set of sun shades that will um, that will uh, will be fielding. There'll be um, RF transparent deployable visors uh, that block the light from reaching the most most of the satellite body, and basically all of the diffuse parts of the main body of the spacecraft. So we'll field a single visor sat test in the next upcoming launch. The date hasn't been announced yet, but it's soon. Uh, it had been mid this month, but um, uh, and then. The intent is to, again, uh, in collaboration with astronomers around the world, uh, observe its effect and, um, and optimize it uh, as much as we can. And then on the launch nine, integrate that visor sat into all the satellites that are deployed an entire stack of 60. Uh, so those are the two darkening techniques that we're using for the longest period that the satellites are on orbit. In other words, the, uh, the five-year lifespan at 550 kilometers. Next slide, please. For the orbit raising period, which is the period just after launch when the satellites are, uh, have completed their health check and they're, uh, they're moving up towards their operational altitude, uh, and in some cases parking to wait until they're in their orbit, but the, the solar arrays are, um, uh, the, are contributing to the brightness. And we've been working with a, an operational technique that would allow us to roll the satellite to allow the sunlight to bounce off instead of the entirety of the flat surface of the solar arrays and the flat part of satellite, 
um, to roll it so that the, the uh, sunlight bounces off the very narrow knife edge of the solar array so that that will reduce reflection. We've been, we've been testing this now and uh, are uh, encouraged uh, by its results and we'll have more to say on that uh, as, as we go along. Next slide. I did want to talk a little bit about what we've taken away from this uh, from this year and what uh, lessons learned we might have for our um, our colleagues in the satellite industry, particularly with the with the many innovations in satellite manufacturing and uh, the reductions in launch uh, price and the improved access to space. We expect that constellations are going to be um, a thing of the future. Uh, for an element, a feature of our space environment. So I was going to put an awareness on here, but I feel like we've already checked that box. It would be, you'd be hard pressed to find someone in the satellite world who's not aware of the potential now that the spacecraft design and the orbital architecture could have an effect on ground-based optical astronomy. We're obviously very aware of those impacts for uh, radio astronomy, since those uh, uh, those interactions are already codified with rules of the ITU and the FCC. We found it very, very fruitful uh, and a very willing uh, and um, productive, productive engagement with um, the optical astronomy community uh, here in the U.S., internationally, uh, and we feel that that's been extremely helpful, not only for our own understanding of what those science missions are and how that informs the telescopes and how they operate, but also how various mitigations that we can potentially consider uh, might be effective. Um, Pat did a really good job of describing the complexity of trying to predict brightness. It's certainly not a simple thing. Um, and we've learned a lot about how those various um, aspects of spacecraft design, the materials, the operations, altitude, um, time of year, time of day, uh, affect the impact that we have on the ability of astronomers to continue operating while we provide broadband services. Um, and I think that one me message would be that satellite operators that are considering multiple satellite systems um, should, I would encourage you to engage with, uh, with uh, the astronomy community to understand how your novel spacecraft design and, and, and project might, uh, might trigger some of the same kinds of concerns. It would of course be best if you could test these in advance, if you could anticipate and verify that uh, the spacecraft you're planning to field uh, will not be uh, uh, a source of, of undue brightness for astronomy. I think there's a lot more to be done there. Um, not all satellite systems, not all satellite manufacturers can interrupt, test, field, uh, and uh, then iterate again to be able to do that. And so I think it would be a, a good outcome to have work towards better fidelity uh, on testing that could effectively simulate the brightness that a given novel spacecraft design might produce. Um, Pat mentioned, I think, in very uh, specific ways how altitude can affect um, the brightness. The, uh, and that trend, I think, to try and fly satellites lower rather than higher is one that's um, underway anyway. The other trend I wanted to mention that I think satellite companies are, are already working towards is to make the location of their satellites more uh, more readily available. That location information uh, that's published and, and available for astronomers can help certain telescopes schedule around satellites, not all of them. Um, but it, it, it can be part of the toolkit that we have to coexist. Um, uh, in terms of regulations, one of the things that I think has been quite interesting is the complexity across the many different kinds of telescopes and science um, missions that exist in astronomy, uh, how complex it is to have a baseline of recommendations of what's acceptable and what isn't, what's impactful, what's workable, what's not. Any regulations need to start with that. I know that um, many of the folks on the call and, and in the leadership in the community are working towards that. Uh, and then figuring out how those would be uh, integrated into some kind of set of guidelines or rules is, is, an, is a, a longer term project that takes some time. Um, and so in the near term, I really do encourage this sort of voluntary collaboration between satellite operators and the, um, and the uh, optical astronomy community so that we can uh, make sure that both of our missions can go forward. 
We plan to share the lessons we've learned. Um, we've been uh, talking at astronomy conferences. We'll do the same at more satellite events once we have events again. Um, and we've put a blog post up on our uh, website that sort of talks about the mitigation approaches I've discussed here in more detail. Uh, and we'll also be coming out with some academic papers. So thank you again for having me and um, looking forward to the, the questions. Thanks, Patricia. This is Joel Perriott. I'm the Director of Public Policy at the American Astronomical Society. And I just had a couple of uh, things uh, before we turn it over to questions. So, Patricia, um, oops. Patricia mentioned the working group that we have here at the uh, American Astronomical Society. This is the email address that you can uh, write to that will uh, trigger emails to all of us on the working group. Our working group has links and immediate ties to the International Astronomical Union and the International Dark Sky Association uh, through Tony and his colleagues to the Vera Rubin Observatory. Uh, to the National NSF's National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Lab. And then, uh, as Patricia also mentioned, in the radio regime, uh, we're consulting with uh, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and other colleagues at the National Academies about lessons learned in the radio space as we think about what happens for optical infrared. One be uh, very open that we're ready to collaborate with any and all interested parties. So please reach out if there's anything uh, that we can do to be helpful or uh, direct you to the right people to speak with. Uh, one of the ways that we're working on trying to come up with guidelines in the nearish to midterm is a uh, workshop that the National Science Foundation is sponsoring. It's just over a month from now. So we really encourage, uh, especially industry uh, participation in this technical workshop. Uh, there's the link at the bottom. Uh, you can also find this just by Googling AAS Satellite Constellations Workshop. And uh, there's a registration process. Uh, and uh, if we get the right kind of people, it's even possible one of our current working groups would be interested in having you participate and contribute meaningfully to the product of the workshop. The outcome of the workshop is to produce a white paper uh, about what's been learned, but ultimately lead to hopefully uh, guidelines uh, that we can uh, promulgate in the future. Uh, the last thing is on the AAS website. This is an obscenely long URL, but you can find it by Googling we have, we're trying to compile everything that Kelsey Crafton on our staff can find. Uh, there's lots of links to different events, to what people are publishing in the peer-reviewed literature uh, on this topic. And we uh, encourage you to, to look at that and then reach out if you need anything. So that's all I have. So I'll send it back to Tom to do Q&A. Great, and actually, Therese Jones from SIA is going to try and fit in as many questions as she can in the two minutes that remain. Uh, um, we uh, certainly will try and make sure all of your questions are answered, obviously not in the next two minutes, but to be able to get them to the, the people to whom they're directed. But Therese, let me turn it over to you. Uh, yep, so thanks, Tom. Um, one of the more popular questions is for Patricia. Um, and wondering if seventh magnitude is now your target, if you have a fainter target magnitude, um, and if SpaceX is willing to make any promises or commitments as far as limiting the total number of non-darkness compliant satellites, such as version 0 0.9 Starlinks that you're going to launch. So we, uh, we have found that the seven de seventh degree magnitude is uh, an interesting threshold because it is not only the visibility threshold for naked eye observation and sort of the effect that uh, that just anyone looking at the night sky might observe, uh, but it's also the the point at which you saturate uh, detectors or so. We're we're learning from our astronomers. I certainly am not one. Uh, the uh, 
there I thought I'd join by by video. Uh, we expect that the version zero, the earlier satellites that we've launched, we don't expect them to have a complete five year uh, lifespan. And we are expecting to cut in the visor sat mitigation uh, at the point that we're launching uh, still in the 500s of satellites. So we would have about 500 satellites at their current brightness. And then all satellites beyond that would have would have these sunshades. So that's, that's I guess, the, uh, the ratio that we would be looking at. But the bulk of those earlier satellites also we would expect would be deorbited over the course of, uh, uh, of the next five years max. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Patricia. Um, and then a question for the astronomers. Um, lots of people seem to be asking about the impact of infrared and radio astronomy. So if you could give a short update on what's being done on the astronomy community around that and what sort of activity is going on right now. I think people would appreciate that. Uh, infrared, the, you know, there are observations that have been taken in Chile and it was answered in the Q&A on um, the, uh, you know, in the short infrared between one and two and a half microns. I'm not aware of any observations at 10 microns, but we would expect based on observations of geosatellites at 10 microns, and scaling them to 550, that they would be some of the brightest objects in the sky at 10 microns. Uh, what, fortunately for us, 10 micron field of views are pretty small at this point, and the satellites would be traveling fast. But I think that's a, an unanswered question in the for the future. Teresa, I can mention on the radio astronomy side, if that's all right. Um, the International Telecommunications Union has uh, made allocations for radio astronomy all up and down the, the frequency bands. Uh, and the interaction between commercial communication satellites or communication satellites, period, and those uh, radio astronomy bands is something that I think has been uh, a, uh, a well-known point of coordination and dialogue at the international level and in national levels, I know, for any of the uh, constellations that were authorized by the FCC, there are requirements that you uh, that you take radio astronomy into consideration in your operation. So there, unlike with optical astronomy, where we're still looking at what those criterion and recommendations might be for safe operation, radio astronomy has a longer history of those kinds of um, uh, performance metrics and and spectrum allocations. Okay, well, I see that we've run over a couple of minutes already, and on behalf of AAS and SIA, I thank, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for participating. I thought this was an extremely informative session. I look forward to following up on the discussions and continuing to collaborate. Um, Joel, um, I know that we've gotten a lot of questions that we weren't able to answer, so we'll plan on following up to see if we might be able to, um, to get answers to those questions and distribute them to the, the over 200 people I know who are participating in our, our webinar today. <clears throat> yeah, certainly we'll do that, of course. Thank you, Tom. Okay, with that, um, I thank uh, all of our, our um, attendees for joining us today. And as I mentioned, the, the slides will be made available uh, and we'll follow up to determine whether we're able to release the recording of, uh, of our session today. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>